Uh, the media tends to portray the U.S. in a bad light, and we, as a general public, only tend to hear the negatives from them. What do you think are some positive movements this country is currently experiencing? Um, positive movements? Yeah. Um, so uh, this right here, what's happening right now, I, I mean, I'm shocked at how many people in this room actually... When me and Charlie started out, we did not have this many people in a room, and we're selling out everywhere that we go right now. And... Let me tell you guys, the most important aspect, and the thing that you should think is actually a positive thing, as crazy as it sounds, censorship. Because censorship is an indication that they're losing. When you have to start requiring fact checkers, when you have to start trying to encourage people to pull content offline and calling everything hate speech, it's because you know that you're no longer winning the argument. So as just one example, when Barack Obama was in office, we never had fact checkers. Uh, we, never ha we never were told that the internet is not a safe place. We never had safe spaces. And the reason for that is because when Barack Obama was in office, the left was winning. Right? The liberals were winning. I was a person that was convinced that they were telling the truth. I cried the night Barack Obama won, like thinking that this was an amazing feat because the media sold that to me. I think it's, they told it to a lot of people. They sold that idea that Barack Obama was going to be the end of all racial strife right, in this country, and yet actually it actually manifested a beginning of racial strife from the time that I was a child. Right? I had never seen anything like it since Obama was in office. So I always say that be encouraged by how desperate they're getting to shut down events like pulling alarms and requiring fact checkers to you know, censor every single thing that we're saying. It's a good thing. Next question. Hi. Hi. Um, what has been the most rewarding part of motherhood for you so far? Okay, the most rewarding part of motherhood for me. I There's a lot of them. Honestly, what I can really say to women is that the most shocking part of motherhood is really how, is, is understanding how lied to we are in the school system about what family represents. I mean, we're constantly given messages like, you won't be ready until you have this, 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 this. Um, having children, even men, same messaging. It's gonna be the end of your life. And I think that one of the things that I'm always amazed at is understanding how severe those lies are. And the most rewarding part, I'm not kidding, is every single day. You get to relive your childhood through your children's eyes, right? Um, and just, I mean, literally, it can be like my son right now, like he is obsessed with french fries. Like he thinks french fries are the greatest thing that's ever happened. And no matter what, we don't give them to him often. They're the baked ones. And if we pull them out of the, out of the oven, he just goes, oh, yeah! <laughs> it's just like, this is so precious, you know? So it, they transform every moment into just this loving, amazing moment. And you realize how jaded we've all become that we don't appreciate, you know, the wonder of it all. So every moment when you have a child is, is amazing. How you doing? My name is George, so I got a cool question. So what advice do you have for, like, guess, you know, a young black guy that's always, like, you know how the world always seems like, you know, black people are always like, you know, you always got to face this, face that. What advice can you tell me that, like, I, what advice can you, sh um, I guess, tell me that what I can, that can help me face the world, you know? Uh, the first advice that I would give you, and it's the best advice that I ever received in my life, and I think I got it for myself, um, is to not see yourself as black and to see yourself as an American because <laughs> my entire world changed when I had my awakening, as I like to describe it, and I realized that the way that we are meant to feel, the way that I felt for 20 plus years of my life was designed. It was a mental prison that I had, cre that I had stepped into, hadn't created for myself, but that I had stepped into purposefully, by design, the education system, con the messaging from culture, culture, telling us constantly that we're black, we're black, we're black. People will never understand us, right? I believed that Republicans were racist and backwards, that I couldn't walk into those rooms and do anything because I was meant to believe those things. Um, and I had my big awakening. It happened, you know, it's a, a bit of a longer story, but it happened in 2015. Um, and suddenly I realized that the reason that black people are trained to see their own oppression is it's because if you view yourself as a victim, you become your own oppressor. It's a mental prison, you can't get ahead. You're constantly thinking people are seeing you because of the color of your skin. And that is the real sadness of what's happening in our society is that all we are doing is preventing people 
from going out in the world and trying something because they're so fearful that they're going to be rejected because of this color of their skin. So I would say as soon as you start seeing yourself as American um, and connecting with people that hold that same philosophy, you will you just unlock all of your creativity and every single passion that you've ever had in your life and you know that you can do it because you know it's possible and that the only thing that's stopping you is your mentality. Thank you. Thank you. Currently, right now, there's an active campaign to can uh, cancel myself and a few of my colleagues for voicing our opinion, our freedom of speech, in a private group chat. And uh, at six years of education on my half, I'm a double major in STEM, and I'd just like some advice on what a person who has been canceled should do. I did, you know, uh, they've called the left has called me uh, an anti-Semite, even though I'm Jewish. I think you know someone else named Ben, who's a Jew and yeah. has been called an anti-Semite. I think Ben might be a Jewish person. Yeah. He has a name. Yeah, I mean, you're totally right. But uh, keep this short. Um, I read Michael Knowles' article, Do Not Apologize, and I was just wondering if you could give me any more advice or some, maybe some support that I could go to. Yeah, absolutely. So first and foremost, know that you were in a unique time having a new, unique experience, and that's why it's important for you to know that it just wasn't like this a few years ago in college. And the entire system is being built right now to break you down psychologically. Right? Um, I read a wonderful piece in the New York Post about a psychological immune system, which people have realized is real. Right? They can break you down psychologically by calling you a bunch of names, by constantly telling you and castigating you and telling you that having these ideas is wrong. And the, the point is to make you feel defeated, right? to make you give in and to think that this is it, I'm done because somebody called me a racist or someone called you an anti-Semite. You have to develop on the back end of that a sense of humor. Let me tell you, I laugh harder. I mean, if people knew how much fun I was having, they would hate me. If journalists, if journalists knew how much I laugh when I read these articles about me, I actually consider the name, the name game of calling me all of these things. Like I'm like playing Pokemon Ball. Like I'm like I gotta catch them all. I gotta catch them all. I'm like they never called me. But, Whoa, they called me it. I got it. I got this unique ball. They called me this, and it's incredible. I, they've called they've called me a racist, right? A self-hating black person. And I'll go. Tom, a coon, an anti-Semite, you know? Uh, so once you realize that words really had no power, first off, you said you're a STEM? Yeah, okay. Double STEM. Yeah, I'd like to see you out in the real world against these people that can't even form a sentence and say F you. They don't want me to be. They don't want you. You're gonna be just fine, I promise you. Hi, Candace. I'm just wondering if you're choosing to homeschool your kids or put them in public school. I get this question all the time. At the moment, um, my every inkling is to homeschool them, but I have to actually wait until I get into that s step because it depends on where you live, how radical the school systems are. Like I'm in Tennessee. Like we still have the original rednecks down there. My assistant's a redneck. Like you know, they don't play around with these woke games down there. Um, and I'm moving deeper into Tennessee, so like Nashville is a bit liberal, like all cities are. But Tennessee is a decisively red state, and we were just the first state that said we're gonna. They found out what was going on in Vanderbilt University Hospital, and they're gonna ban that. So um, I think that what I always say to parents is to make sure that you are a hawk. You know, when you're going out to decide what school your children should be in, make sure you're asking all of the right questions, that you're speaking to parents locally and seeing what their ideas are, and get as involved as possible. I obviously, of course, would love for my child to have that social experience of going to public school, um, but I'm a real mama bear, and if I find out one teacher said something funny to my kid, it's gonna be a bad day in hell for that teacher. <laughs> Hi, Candace. Hey. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of tough navigating the real world as a straight white male. How would It's how so would you, true. It's so sad. What is some of the best advice you could give a straight white male just trying to get through modern day America? This is honestly like the realest question I've ever been asked. I'm just, <laughs> I, and I'm laughing because I feel so bad and it's so crazy that we're here in life where like this should, this is the question that was probably asked uh, by black Americans anywhere as they came together during times of Jim Crow and now suddenly it's like, gosh, I, I better just problematize myself and you have literally white people that are pretending to be gay or something on their college apps just so people are like, oh, there's something, you know, there's something different about them so now I'll let them into school and it's it's not a meritocracy if you're a white male. They're openly saying we don't want you because you're a white male. Um, so I first want to validate
validate this question 100% because, I mean, I just did Dr. Phil. I was sitting around with professors that were saying that they will not allow people into their school if they're white, right? Because it's just problematic to be white. Um, so the first thing I would say is that bless the fact that we live in this country and that you can be entrepreneurial and you can start your own businesses and you don't have to worry about what other people think about you or whether or not they like you. The second thing is that um, every person who is being treated like that needs to figuratively, nope, you know, figuratively grow a pair, right? Stop apologizing would be the first thing that I would say, right? The problem is that when you are being, yes, you should applaud that. Stop apologizing when you do nothing wrong. Um, and I think that what has happened is that people have been so afraid of being smeared that they just apologize even when they, when they don't mean it. And that is the first thing that weakens a person, is saying stuff that you don't mean. It doesn't just weaken the individual, it weakens society at large. Um, and so if you do something wrong, you obviously say sorry, but if you don't do something wrong, don't apologize. And know that you're, in, you're, you know, you're amongst friends when you're in a room filled with conservatives, whether they're black, white, Hispanic, we all know what's actually happening in this country. And I do think that the size of this room demonstrates the mist of a sea change. So stay firm. Hi, um, my advice is um, how to, to give advice to my daughter. On last Wednesday on the way to school, my seven-year-old in the back seat became hysterical. When asking her what was wrong, she told me she didn't want to be white anymore. That's so sad. And that her white classmate told her that being white means that they kill black people. Oh. Um, that was absolutely heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, of course, then I dive into who her parents are and they are white mm -hmm. um, from out east. Um, what advice can I give my daughter? I told her God doesn't make mistakes and that she's the right color. Um, what other things could I have told her? You can tell her all those things, but you should also breathe fire and see where, you know, how, why that is taking place. Because if that ever happened to my kid, I mean, that's just heartbreaking that kids go through that. But that tells you that there's an administrative problem that that was allowed to happen, you know? I would first and foremost, that happened at school, right? Um, it happened on at recess from my understanding. Yeah, and so the first thing that you should do is that you need to make sure that you go and you represent your child and you are her voice and you tell the teachers and the administration exactly what happened. Because if it happens to her and you say nothing, it's going to happen happen to the next kid. Those kids that said that to her should be made an example of, right? When you tell somebody that that's what's going to happen to them because of the color of their skin, you know, that's, that's racism. You're, you're this because you're white. If that had ever happened, again, if you inserted and you switched the races, if that had ever happened to a young black girl and they said something fundamentally racist to a young black girl, they would have suspended everyone. They would have suspended people that didn't even make sense. They would have just suspended all white people from school, right? Mm -hmm. It would have been like the number one top trending topic on Twitter. The Washington Post would have come down and gloriously sat with the NAACP and talked about this event. You know, when something horrible and backwards and racist happens to your kid, you have to be their voice. So Parents have to have a spine. You need to talk to the administration, talk to the principal, talk to the teacher, and raise some hell about that. Do It'll you, help the next kid. Do I reach out to the parents too? Yeah, or? the okay. parents, everyone. I would reach out to everyone. Thank you. Honestly, I just pray that it's never my kid. I feel so bad for the people that will be involved if that is my child <laughs> that goes through anything like that. Hi, Candace. Hey. Uh, my name is Zach. So uh, I, I, have to, I have to admit something to you. I'm uh, very, very moderate. I used to think that that means everyone agrees with me. I've discovered that it means that no one does. <laughs> I love that. But um, that being said, uh, I grew up um, and built a lot of friends with very varying different political views. And for me, that was never something that's an issue. But I found as I've grown older and as I've gone through college, it's become incredibly difficult to be able to connect and really build a sense of camaraderie and unity across people with beliefs different than mine or where my beliefs are different than theirs. What, what do you say we can do to really rebuild um, unity? Um, I think it comes down to being able to know what a friendship is and what a friendship isn't. I went through this a lot, obviously, when I had my awakening and everyone around me was a leftist or a liberal because that was how I lived my life. And I realized I didn't have anything in common with these people anymore. And what I decided to do was that I was not going to not be who I was because if I had to censor elements of myself, it wasn't a real friendship, right? That that's a performance. If you have to walk into a room and and pretend to be someone else, that turns you into an actor. And I'm not. I can't be somebody's actor or actress. I can be somebody's friend. And to calmly explain to them what I think, and if they s ever did anything, you know, that said, oh, well, having these opinions makes you this or that. We're not. We're not friends. And that's not because of political beliefs. It's because you believe me to be a horrible person. So the advice that I'm giving to you is not to compromise who you are. Don't feel like you need to transform everybody into yourself. But know that real friends 
even if they have differences in beliefs, can be respectful to each other. I have friends where we agree on like 80% of things, 20% of the things we don't, we just kind of don't have those topics. But if, if they wanted to force that conversation, they would know where I stood on it. Um, and that's a productive friendship. A lot of my friends changed um, because again, your friendships are determined by your values and that's okay. Um, I think that the second that I stopped trying to hold on to these friendships that were completely not friendships in the retrospect. I had one girl that I really tried to hold on to. Um, it was a friend um, that lives down in Argentina and I've been friends with her for such a long time and I wrote about it in my book. It's, it's one of my chapters. Um, and eventually I just realized this is so toxic. It makes me miserable every time I talk to this person. Why am I doing this, right? And, and what will happen is new friendships will pop up in their place and they will be better and they will bring you closer to being a more formed and a happy person. You have a right to pursue happiness. Thank you. Hey. Uh, so congrats on your movie. Um, Thank I know you. it takes a lot of effort to put stuff like that out there. Um, let me see. So uh, I know you've spoken on like toxic black culture and all that stuff. Um, besides public speaking, um, what are you doing to combat against toxic black culture and then how does your movie unveiling BLM add to what you're doing do you see how it can add to it um, do you see how it can hinder the movement I don't know. yeah thank you that's a great question I'm so glad you asked it obviously because it just lets me brag about myself um, so the thing that the media never tells about anybody and it's so infuriating that they ever say about me is that it's just like Candace is just critiquing black America and then they just strip away everything that I do for black America. I run a charity. It's called Blexit.com. It's a successful charity and we are in 39, actually now 41 states. You can go on to Blexit.com and you can see what we are doing in these inner cities. We have after school programs in which we pick up these children that are in disadvantaged, uh, uh, dis disadvantaged districts and we bring them so that they can learn different ideas and so that their parents don't have to worry about them being on the streets. Aside from after school programs, we run summer camps for these children so that they have somewhere to go so that their parents don't have to worry about them being on the streets. Aside from just complaining about BLM and all the destruction that it brought to inner cities, we raised over $100,000 and gave it. We picked black businesses that had been destroyed in the George Floyd riots and we gave it to them. Now I'm telling you all this stuff because the media never will. They need to paint me as a monster and a person that hates my own race because I have higher expectations because we should have higher expectations and there's been this routine lowering of the bar. In terms of the documentary, my purpose in producing that film was that I never thought that there was a more toxic narrative for black American than the George Floyd story and the lies surrounding it. Um, and I wanted to do that film in a compassionate way because after speaking to his roommates, I felt sad. This was a man that was struggling with drug addiction. Drug addiction is something that probably every single person in this room can relate to I somebody in your family, a cousin, a brother. Um, this is something that touches Americans. and. The George Floyd story should have been a story that brought Americans together. And it's not his fault that after he died, horrible people used a media narrative to divide, uh, divide Americans, to burn down black inner city communities, and to raise BLM into the multi-million dollar uh, organization that stole, that essentially stole from Americans. Um, and so I wanted to expose all of that because I think that once you expose a lie that big, it helps people be less emotional and to really understand, which was, I think, the thesis of my film, which is that the media is our enemy. Um, so then, what can I do to add to what you're doing? Um, sorry, I didn't get that. I said, what can I do to add to what you're doing? Join Blexit. We, we join the Blexit chapter, get involved. Every single person, I better see Blexit numbers going off. The ch you know, as soon as you got here, Blexit.com, see what we're doing. And it's an organization that's these it's small pocket donors that give a dollar a month that allows us to do what we do and to actually make a difference. And it's the, it's the honestly, it's the best part of what I get to do other than going home to my children. Hello, my name is David. I have a short question followed by a longer one. The first one is, do you have any recommendations for middle ground sources that you could give to people who you want to ease into more conservative ideas? Would you say I'm not a moderate middle of the ground source? Fair okay, enough. fine, fair enough, fair enough. Um, you know what, I, it depends on where they are at ideologically. I think probably if they were on the left and you were trying to bring them over this way, 
tell them they should watch a little more Bill Maher because it seems like something's dawned on Bill Maher um, as he's starting to cover how toxic woke culture has become and it's leading to him being attacked. I mean, the greatest voices that we have are people that are, you know, still identify as liberal and um, are realizing that something has gone really wrong and awry. Um, so I think Bill Maher is great at that. You know, Dave Rubin, who was, you know, a liberal, uh, I think the first time he ever said that he thought he was conservative was you know, a couple of months ago or maybe in his last book or something. But he, watching all of his old stuff on YouTube, he was like fully on the left, fully liberal. And you can actually see how just his mind changed after having conversations and being at least open to having conversations. So I would say those would be like two people that you could probably point them to um, that still do great work and are able to host people on both sides. And by the way, Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan is not a conservative. I don't know what the media is trying to pretend he is. He talks to people on the far left. He talks to people in the middle. Um, and you know, Spotify has done a good job of standing by him. So I think that he's also a helpful resource. And then my follow-up question, this one's a bit more specific. Um, during a debate that I had in uh, one of my classes, uh, we were talking about the validity of the First Amendment Establishment Clause pertaining to a Ten Commandments statue that's at Fargo City Hall. And Okay, we probably have to give me some details on that. Yeah, so there... Fargo uh, at, City Hall. At, at Fargo City Hall, there's a monument that has the Ten Commandments on it, mm -hmm. cross that has a reference to Judaism, and it was donated by a a group back in like 1970, and then a group called the Red River Free Thinkers believed that it was an establishment of religion on government property, because it, it was technically on government property, and they believed that it should be removed, or at the very least that more groups should be able to add monuments to it, and then uh, there was a, a petition to have it not removed by the people of Fargo, and they decided to not remove it, but then the city hall put in a accord, or not an accord, a mandate that said that no other monuments could be put on the same land, mm -hmm. and in the debate I basically cited saying that it should stay, but other groups should be able to add, or other mm -hmm. religious groups should be able to add their own, say, moral or law documents that are a part of history and how we came about bringing up things like governments. So. In that debate, I argued along those lines of uh, it should stay because it has historical significance and moral significance, or history to the morality of people. And I think that given that those ideas would manifest in a place such as a city hall, they have validity in staying there. Mm -hmm. And one of my classmates asked me if me believing that it should stay was erasing the ideas of other religions, and this is a quote here, similar to how Texas is removing uh, critical race theory and gender mm -hmm. studies from okay. their universities. This is just like the left defiling history is what you're talking about, and like well, their whole I'm idea now. How you would respond yeah, well, to because it's like the, the whole idea that. is that like they're actually trying to put something new. If your if your argument, and again, I don't have all the details on this, is that the preservation of history is good and it's important. Um, I agree with that fullheartedly. Right? This is something that obviously has historical significance. What they're trying to do is say it needs to either be defiled, removed, um, or we need to put something new here that never existed and has no historical significance here. Obviously, if it's been there, there's a reason that it's been there. Um, and I, I think that we need to realize is that when you're the, what the left wants to do is to create this idea of a progressive forward fu fu future um, where nothing really exists and everything's wrong and everything's backwards. They every, look through everything in a lens of everything that happened before us is bad, right? Everything is bad. Tradition is bad. Judeo-Christian beliefs are bad. Anything that got us here to this moment in time is bad and it needs to be wiped out because at the end of the day, they're nihilistic, right? They're nihilistic. They are an they're anarchists and they are angry. I mean, the idea of this is even a debate should tell you like how, what, how, what did the statue do? This is happening all across America, um, and so what it really is is that it's it's a val a, val uh, a battle between traditional values and a battle between traditional values and progressivism. And the truth about progressivism is that there's nothing more regressive than people that purport to want to you know go into the future. Actually, what they're doing is they're sending us back. Now we're having these race issues in debate. We're being told that we're not allowed to love God. And I already pointed to while I was on stage what it is really that they're after, which is really a society that has nothing but the state, right? So we can't have the cross, you can't have the Star of David because in its place you're supposed to be worshiping the state and that should get you to what they're really after. It's not even a sincere debate that they're having. It's totally and disingenuous. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Candace. Hello. My name's Clara. 
I'm just wondering, as a young woman in college, what's a tidbit of advice or knowledge that you wish that you were told, or young men as well, um, just some advice that you wish you had with you in college? Um, that the entire experience is temporal, enjoy it. Don't get too frustrated in the arguments because what's going to happen is these ideologues that are outside marching are going to be smacked in the face with real world consequences when they get out into the real world and realize <laughs> that nobody needs a gender studies major, right? <laughs> and so in the end, even if you feel like you're losing the battles in your classroom, you are going to win them in the real world when you have a STEM major and you have people that are actually able to be productive in society. And those people that you saw in the hallways marching are not gonna be competing with you. They're going to continue to march for every single cause and they're not gonna have anything, they're gonna have a radical emptiness if they don't transform themselves before it. So what I would say is tether yourself to the reality that in the end, we win. Thank you. Hi, Candace. I'm hey. Hannah. Hey, um, Hannah. So my question was, you kind of talked about censorship earlier, about how it's a good thing, but also as a college student, how do you combat that? Because, you know, growing up, people always told me, like, be careful. People can take screenshots of everything. Mm -hmm. Like, um, they What do you mean censorship is a good thing? Oh, you were mentioning it earlier, like, that we're winning that censorship is oh happening. oh okay i get what you're saying oh, yeah sorry sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah no i mean like yeah it's a good thing it indicates wrong. that we're winning yeah. yeah that's very true but it is happening and so yeah. like how do you combat it exactly yeah. because you know if you were trying to get a job like i've heard of instances where people you know pull out oh you posted this on facebook so many years ago yeah so. well the first thing that i would say is yes look out for that that's dangerous and it's scary that they're doing that is that they're trying to have this trial by fire of what you said and what you thought the truth is, is that you're growing up. You're gonna be an idiot. Part of growing up is the experience and being allowed to be an idiot. The difference is, when I was a kid, we were allowed to be dumb for a little bit, and we didn't have social media. It was the land before Facebook and Twitter, and you get to try out being mean. You know, on the playground, you say some stuff, and like, whatever. You get home, it's like, actually, I shouldn't have said that. I didn't feel good when I said that. You were allowed to grow up. And one of the greatest sins of this generation is that they're telling people that they don't have the right to transform, right? And they don't have the right to grow up, that everything you say is forever and you're not allowed to um, really evolve. We're talking about evolution, which is so natural to the human spirit. And when you can't evolve, you die. When you stop evolving and growing, you die. And you have people that are being told that psychologically, this is all you'll ever be. So I hate that, I resent that. And the, the, way, the way to combat that is that when we get out into the real world and we're the ones that are having the companies, we stop doing that crap. We stop saying, let me check out to see what this person said when they were 11 years old and their mom let them have TikTok, right? We need to say, okay, this person was 11 years old, they were a child, and I would not have survived that trial by childhood had I had, been, had had TikTok when I was 11 either. None of us were great people. Don't let these freaking bad faith actors pretend like, oh my God, what you did was so horrible. I was just so great when I was 10. They're not, they're really not. Um, they're not even great when they're two. My kid's yelling at me. He's over yelling at me, right? Um, and so tether yourself to that reality. Know that, you're go that what's going to happen naturally is that there's going to be the answer to the left-leaning economy. We're now seeing the beginning of the conservative economy. It's the reason why someone like Elon Musk steps up and says, I wanna buy Twitter, right? Or Ye wants to buy Parler. It's because people that are conservative are realizing that censorship is a threat to everyone. Um, and so what's naturally going to happen and what is happening is that we are creating our own space and we are going to flourish and we're gonna win. Thank you. Hello. Uh, first off, I'd like to say thank you for coming to our campus. Uh, the question I have is, in an education system ruled by leftist nuts and <laughs> liberal professors who spew their ideological garbage upon their students from a position of power, is there a time to stand up for truth? And if so, when? Always. What do you mean, always, absolutely. I mean, and the same advice that I gave to the mother who said, what do I do? If you write a paper that disagrees with an ideologue and they give you a bad grade because they're an ideologue, you better take that all the way to the top. I mean, you better, until we start creating a problem and exposing these schools, so that's what they hate. They hate publicity, right? They never like it when a story goes viral about what happened on their campus and how they treated a student, and so you guys have to create that publicity when they do things like that and show them that we're not the minority. I mean, look around in this room. Like, you guys are not the minority. They just want you to feel like you're the minority. The radical left is a, is a minority. The, ma the majority of people in the United States of America don't think that kids can pick their genders, right? You feel that way because they are a minority that controls the education system. 
Um, so it's, it's incredibly important that you never think that there's a period of time in your life where you should stop telling the truth or stop saying the truth. Right? You should never get used to lying to yourself or to others. That's what they want you to do. Um, so don't let that program to happen. And the other thing which I always say, and this is maybe a bad time because we're on a college campus, is really consider whether or not you even need to go to university. Don't let allow that peer pressure campaign of like, oh, if you don't get a degree, you're not gonna be successful, so you know, take $100,000 out in student loans and already owe the government, talk about statism, before you even get out and try or even know what you wanna do. That's why I went to school, I felt peer pressured to go to school. Nothing that I am doing has anything to do with what I was studying in school, I promise you, least of all that stupid feminist class that I was supposed to take as a prereq. Anyways, that's all, I'm not gonna rant about that. Next question. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Candice. I'm Michael. Hey, Very Michael. Nice to meet you. Um, my question is basically, uh, what are your thoughts on political leaders having agendas that are trying to phase out and remove coal mining as a resource for energy? Do not ever vote for them, ever. I mean, it is so ridiculous. Talk about an ideologue. The idea that we're going to live in a society, that's why I said earlier, like the energy, the whole energy stuff, it's, it's green on the outside and it's red on the inside, right? The idea that we're going to somehow, like in California, they're trying to pass a law that is banning uh, vehicles that are not electric after 2024, right? Or 2000, I'm sorry, 2000 maybe 28, I can't remember the exact year. Completely ridiculous. It's the reason why they're facing an energy crisis in Europe right now, today. Right, because a bunch of ideologues said, no, don't have nuclear energy, even though nuclear energy is clean energy. Right, This whole idea that, oh, well, we just shouldn't be drilling here in America. We could be completely independent. We could be completely independent. Um, so it's ridiculous, and what they really are doing is they're trying to prevent you from using energy. Right, If you think that when Leonardo DiCaprio gets on his private jets and flies to speak at a climate conference, that he's gonna give up his private jets they're, they're gonna ask you to give up your private jets. If you think that these people are just sipping the same disgusting paper straws that melt in your mouth while telling you that you should do it, you're out of your mind. The idea is to create a permanent underclass of people that tell you, as Gavin Newsom has done, we need to only use electric vehicles, but this summer, please turn off your AC because the electric grid is already suffering. Can you imagine a world where you can't even drive your car to work because suddenly there's a mandate that says no driving and we all have electric vehicles? Again, the idea is to move power from the individual and to cede it to the state. Do not ever do that. It is completely ridiculous, least of all, when we know that the leaders in all of this carbon emission crap, which by the way, carbon is good, don't get me on a rant about freaking carbon and the lies surrounding that, right? But the, re the real offenders are China and they're not playing the game, right? You think China's ever gonna stop with, with that energy industry? No, but the, what they will do is control the entire global economy because us idiots over here are playing Green New Deal. So it's crap, never listen to it. It's, it's, it, it just leads to us not having any power over our own lives. Hi, um, I have a question followed by a request. Um, I grew up with like my voice being silenced. I was in autistic black um, bisexual foster in the foster system and I worked hard to get my voice back and now I've got my you know foot in a bunch of advocacy groups and am now coming across the point where my voice is being silenced again mm. like an hour ago when we were out there or this last election and I was just wondering if you had any like help that you could or advice that you could offer is your voice being silenced by individuals just like in general like after the last election i like multiple times for some reason got told that i wasn't allowed to be black anymore yeah that happened to me don't worry don't yeah. worry about it that's mm -hmm. yeah, cool um it's ridiculous it doesn't yeah. make any sense no one can take away your blackness right and so somebody waving a magic wand and calling you anti-black or anti-semitic as ben told us in line earlier or you know calling you a homophobe or all of these words they come out with it's an attempt to silence you because they want you to be fearful of saying what you actually think to be true did it happen when they said you're not black did you magically turn into a white person they're idiots. Don't listen to them. Honestly, keep talking. Find people that that agree with you, and don't don't feel let down by that process. Thank you. And then my request was, could I shake your hand? Yes, of course. Aw, you're so sweet. Sorry, it's all sweaty from holding this mic. It's so nice to meet you. Yes. Hi. Of course. Thank you so much. Hello. Hi, my name is Dawson. 
And uh, I'm pro-life, but I also believe that, you know, in very extreme circumstances, if an abortion is needed, it, it should be performed. Like if there's harm to the mother or child or, you know, like rape of a very young female. Um, I was wondering if you ever think that there will be a middle point that both sides will meet in the middle and finally agree on something to... No. And I'll tell you why. It's because the left argues in extremes, right? So the reason why you said, but in the circumstances, a child is raped is because they've already conditioned you to argue in an extreme, right? So imagine if we govern a society that wasn't the best, not like according to doing the best for the most people, we argued in extremes, right? So we're like, hey, you know, you should put your kid, your kid should wear a seatbelt. And you're like, okay, but what if I'm driving my car and my car flips over and the seatbelt actually traps my child and I can't get them out? Because that actually happened one time in Arkansas on Highway 7. You're like, oh, and then suddenly they're like, well, we can't just have, we can't have seatbelt. We would have nothing. We would have nothing. There are always going to be extreme circumstances. Our challenge is to make sure that what is happening is doing the most good to the most people, right? And because the left loves extremes, they always argue in terms of extremes, we're never gonna come to an agreement, right? So that's an unfortunate thing that's true. And by the way, you can obviously point to the fact that the states that they pretend are so backwards, they've already carved out legislation for those pieces of extremes, but what could happen, which I always think about, is what if you say rape is a reason that you can't get an abortion, you're gonna have a bunch of women that are false accusing and that's gonna create another problem. So it's important to just govern for the most good, for the most people, and move on from it. Okay, thank you. My question for you is I'm an elementary education major and I bet there's probably teachers and like people who are going to education here too what is advice for us who are conservative teachers or going into teaching, just like advice in general? Mm. It's hard because I really do believe that the Department of Education needs to be destroyed. Um, and it's, it just, yeah. Yeah, I know. Um, I have been hoping that conservatives are gonna come up with a conservative solution. So I again rely upon the free markets and I hope that what we end up doing is actually creating like an app. I mean, we've created all these stupid apps like you know Tinder and all this stuff. Why can't we have an app where you can match with a teacher that's not crazy? and then have homeschooling sessions and be like, this person teaches this, I'm normal, I don't think a child can pick their gender, and I have a degree. So I'm hoping that technology plus education, ed tech is going to be the next great dawning, especially following COVID, where parents are looking for solutions, uh, because handing us into like the public school system is just not a solution. And my advice to you would be to target private schools. Um, yeah, because it's, you know, it still can be bad, yep. but your chances are gonna be better than if you feed into the system. Guys, I'm gonna do one more question. I'm so sorry to cut off, but the line, the line keeps getting bigger. I'm so sorry, guys, I'm so sorry. Um, so let me just start off by saying, thank you for coming out tonight. Huge honor to talk to you. Um, your, your name has come up on Instagram feed every now and then, and I didn't realize you had like almost five mil followers on Instagram. You're so. late to the party. <laughs> yeah, now I'm here. <laughs> um, okay, so long story short, kind of long story. Uh, so my parents are immigrants from the Philippines. Um, and you know they face a lot of prejudice, just from people saying, "Oh, you're you're immigrants, you know, you you guys aren't gonna make it, you know, and you know all this stuff, like all these stereotypes that we have to believe in these sort of norms." Um, long story short, my mom's been here for three years. Uh, she's um, she owns three businesses, and my two older siblings are both in the Air Force, and my sister is a master sergeant. Um, so I was just wondering, what do you have to say for those people? Yeah. Wow. The real reason that nobody ever talks about Asians is because they're actually the most successful people in this country. I appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. it's true. And there's a reason why, you know, yeah. so they when they they always try to pit black versus white. So you hear things like, you know, a white people are more likely to be accepted for a credit card than a black person. Mm -hmm. um, and black people are being turned out more, uh, turned down more for credit cards. And the reason uh, that they never enter the other fact, which is that Asian Americans are more likely to get a credit card than white Americans, is because it dispels their rumor that it's white versus black, and it actually shows you that we have a meritocracy. The truth about Asians is that they have a better culture, right? Mm -hmm. They focus on education. I remember, first and foremost, my second boyfriend in life was Filipino, so I'm educated about this matter. <laughs> But I We're just, and yeah, he had like a crazy, you know, like crazy Filipino moms. Like, I mean, she was like hardcore. She, oh, she didn't mess yeah. around. And then I had this girl who I was best friends with named Kathy and she was Japanese and her dad was terrified. Like, Kathy had to go home and she had to study and she had to get, she was expected to get straight A's. 
And that culture that they have seeded, it's the reason why literally, if you want to talk about discrimination happening in this country, it's Harvard turning down Asians. It's they're saying there's too many Asians that are doing well in this country and we don't want you. We need to fill in a couple of blocks here and, and put black people in your place, even though they're working harder and they deserve to have those spots in uni the university level. Um, so the truth is, is that, and it's something we should talk about, there is such a thing as fostering better cultures, right? And that's why I talk about the fact that black America has fostered a culture that does not focus on education, right? The things that are glorified in black culture is you want to be like LeBron. Nobody talks about Thomas Sowell. Nobody talks about Condoleezza Rice. In fact, not only do they not talk about them, they call them Uncle Toms and they call them goons. They're rejected. All right, so we have a culture that thinks it's success and you have a one in a billionth chance to become the next LeBron James, but you have a 100% chance of becoming the next doctor if you stay in school. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think Asians are a stunning example of what it means to foster a good culture and to show you that no matter who you are, uh, if you come to this country with good ideas, you're willing to work hard that you can become successful. God bless you guys. God bless the American dream. Thank you. Thank you.